What's going on, everybody? Uh, welcome to the latest episode of our podcast, Mass Media Hysteria. My name is Court. I'm your host. This, as always, is Chris. What's going on, everyone? Uh, Andres is not here today. He's off this week. He'll be back next week. Um, but uh, I'll tell you what we're going to be <clears throat> talking about in the show today in a minute. But I should plug uh, yesterday, Chris and Andres on their own did uh, a sort of version of this podcast doing a full spoiler review of Godzilla versus Kong because they're both huge Godzilla fans. That is up on the channel right now. It's like an hour and 40 minutes. So they're going to go deep. Chris, you and I have not talked about it. I haven't had a chance to watch the review yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, we, at the end of this show, we are we are going to do a bit of a Godzilla versus Kong spoiler review because I want to be able to talk about it with you. Yeah. And, and my review on my channel is spoiler free, so I want to sort of get into that. We'll get to that. So first today, we're going to be talking about episode three of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. As always, this will be a spoilers review. This is episode three, which is titled Power Broker. Mm-hmm. Then we're going to talk about the brand new trailer. I believe it dropped yesterday for Black Widow, which is finally apparently coming soon. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Then we're going to talk about uh, Godzilla versus Kong's box office because it's actually kind of crazy. <clears throat> and then, like I said, at the end of the show, we will do a, a bit of a, a review of Godzilla versus Kong. So if we're good to get into it, uh, the third episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier is called Power Broker. Now, normally on this show... Um, I kind of host this segment. Um, I'm going to admit, I really enjoyed this episode, but for whatever reason, I don't know if it's a problem with me or if it was something with the episode, but I found myself really distracted and I had to kind of keep re-watching scenes. So Chris is going to run point on this one and uh, it's going to be good. So take it away, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first to start off like with without jumping into to main uh, plots or main spoilers or anything, just uh, generally speaking, I thought this was... My, my thoughts on this episode are consistent with the other two, where I am quite enjoying it. I, I think that it's really well done. There's, there's, a, there's a nice splash of style when it comes to the direction. Of course, the character interactions are still key here, and they introduce, not necessarily introduce, but they bring in other, other dynamics, because before it was pretty much just writing on the uh, buddy cop relationship between Falcon and Winter Soldier. Now they threw in uh, Baron Zemo into the mix. So I thought that was quite good. We'll go into more specifics with it. But yeah, overall, general th- uh, feelings before going kind of more specific. It, it's still the same where I think it's a really good show. I enjoy watching it. I just still haven't found that hook for me, that that burning desire for me to be like, I need to see this um see the next episode and i'm not sure if it will because we're about halfway through now i think there's only going to be six episodes i believe and that's true yeah I, so i think that at this point if it's if it's not giving me the same kind of like must see that wandavision was giving me then it's just kind of is what it is at this point but it's still a well done show uh what are your just general thoughts on the episode so far kind of right wait, wait, quite, i'm really off my game today i'm sorry man kind, it happens kind of right there with you yeah it's it's I'm digging it. I'm liking the action. I'm really liking the interaction between uh, Bucky and Sam. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, we brought in a couple other characters in this one, which I thought was cool. There was some really good action. But uh, again, yeah, I'm, I'm just like, like, yeah, it's cool. It doesn't, it doesn't have that like wow factor for me that WandaVision had. WandaVision, it was like, particularly after you got through the first two episodes, which were pretty much just straight sitcom. Mm-hmm. After that, it was just kind of like, where is this thing going? What is going on? Here, it's like, I know what's going on. I am I am liking, though, that this series has kind of a, almost a Bond, Mission Impossible kind of flavor and that they're jet-setting oh, totally. all over the world. And that, I think, is really cool. And I can't imagine how expensive this show must have been mm-hmm. to shoot, like just traveling all over the world to film in these locations. But mm-hmm. um, I'm digging it. I'm just, I'm not loving it. Yeah, for sure. Um, no, I think that's a great, it's a great way of putting it. And I think that kind of slides perfectly into, into like talking more specifics about it. One of the things that I got, especially in this episode, was very much a kind of like a 90s thriller, almost like a spy thriller. Not that, more just in the plotting, where it was a lot of like kind of this convoluted kind of like, okay, we got to go to here, and then we got to go to here. Um, and it's a lot of tech talk. It's a lot of like, oh, we got to give the information. A lot of talk about people off screen that we never meet. And it's fun. I am I say convoluted, but I don't mean it in, in a dirty way. I mean it in that it's, 
it just gave me that feeling like the original kind of, kind of a Brian De Palma uh, Mission Impossible before it was just Tom Cruise doing stunts. It was a lot of like thick plotting and we got to go to Berlin and then we got to go to Munich and then we're back to America. Um, so in that aspect, I thought it was, it's really good. In fact, it, it sort of starts off that way. R the, the first thing we're introduced to in this episode essentially is like, it's like a plug. It's like an infomercial, infomercial for like the GRC. I forget what that stands for, but it's a, oh God. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I could pull it up before before we uh, before this, the end of the show. This is something Repatriation Council. I don't remember what the G stood for. Um, oh, I just got it. Global, yeah, Global, global uh, re Repatriation Council. Essentially, yeah. um, there was a similar little kind of slideshow thing in in Godzilla. I'll, I'll mention that later. But essentially, what what I what I enjoyed about this little opening um, is that it's it's doing a little bit more world building of showing just what, how, how life is being affected or was affected by the blip. Yeah. Something I've, I find very fascinating. Um, we mentioned this before uh, when talking about the show, but also in WandaVision, how, you know, there was, there's so much questions. There's so much that could have happened that did probably happen within those five years between infinity war and Endgame, And I'm really happy that they're exploring it. So essentially the GRC is sort of, um, this reintegration reintegra program for people that came back five years later, boop, they haven't aged a day. What's what's it going to be like for them? Like, how do they in go back into society? Like, if their if their spouses have remarried, if their family have have died, yada, yada. Like, it's there's just so much, so many implications. So I'm glad that they're kind of teasing it. They didn't go into full detail, but it starts off with that, and it's sort of. Um, leads into kind of the philosophy of the main bad people in this in this show which is the flag smashers a group of kind of radical they really this is the first episode where they go full-on radical terrorists yeah um in regards to pushing their message of like life was better during the blip when it was half a billion people no not half a billion like <laughs> like three to four billion people less in the world um and from there it goes straight into us seeing a bit of a the new Captain America, John Walker in action again. And it, it gave us a nice flavor of, um, of how he's different than Steve in just little scenarios. Like he, he's um, doing the globe trotting thing. They're across, across the world. I think, I believe they're in Europe. They kind of burst into this headquarters they believe were uh, sheltering people that belong to Flag Smashers. And just the attitude that John Walker had was just this aggressive, like I will beat the, ever living snot out of you just so far removed what i got from it was that he was so far removed from the kind of calm cool demeanor of steve rogers now mm -hmm. steve rogers would you know he'll kick your ass in a minute if you give him reason to but he's not looking for a fight he'll stand right. up for people but he's not looking for a fight and he's not a bully and i really got this vibe that i mean one of the one of the guys that john walker is interrogating spits on him and i thought he was going to take that dude's head off yeah. you know like what did you think about that introduction of him i <clears throat> i kind of i actually kind of liked it because you know we've talked on the show before about how <clears throat> i feel like i feel like he's not necessarily a bad guy or a good guy i feel like there mm -hmm. are just layers to him like he's kind of probably a good guy he's just kind of a kind of a dick mm -hmm. um and i like that this sort of showed that i mean he's still doing his mission he's trying to you know but like you said he's got such a different way of acting than steve did and just as a total side note i've come to really like his captain america suit i think it's really cool um mm -hmm. particularly the fact like the the star and the a here but the strap goes over it but the logo's like on the strap too i don't know yeah, it just yeah. looks cool mm -hmm. i still i still think his face looks a little goofy in the mask but uh, or the helmet or whatever but mm -hmm. but yeah i thought i thought that was a good opening and, and yeah like when the guy spit in his face like i did think it was gonna throw down yeah yeah and it, it just seemed like one of those things where in that situation steve that wouldn't have been a cause for him to fight somebody like right. he you know he probably would have looked looked at him like don't push me but the fact that this dude like he he lost it i thought it was great yeah I'm not, I'm not saying this is a negative i thought it was an interesting insight or look into this character yeah where yeah he's not a he's not a villain at least not yet I, he's not a villain and but he just seems like a guy he seems like a guy that has too much of a chip on his shoulder that he wants to prove to the world that he's captain america and to give him credit even though he he was 
you know, grilling that guy that spit on him, he didn't actually do anything. So I'll give him that, that he, he did, you know, take the higher road and didn't actually just attack this dude unprovoked, which I appreciated. But as we'll see later on throughout this episode, his morality is getting more blurred, which is also good, but it's, it's, it's interesting. And, but that, that's jumping ahead a little bit. Um, after this scene, we go right into what's kind of the, the, the meat of the episode, which is the interactions between Bucky, Falcon, and Baron Zemo. So Bucky and Sam go to, I believe it's, is it Munich? Where, where Zemo is? It's somewhere in- It sounds right, I think it was Germany, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's Germany, yeah. Um, so they go to see Zemo. He's no longer in kind of this, uh, in that like weird kind of cage that Javier Bardem was in, in Skyfall. He's in like a more kind of like regular prison now. And um, uh, a great, uh, this is the first thing that I thought uh, when they said they were gonna go see him. Bucky is the one that goes in to talk to Zemo. Sam just kind of hangs back. So Buck and Sam, by the way, is, is completely against this the entire way. He's like, this, yeah. we don't need this guy. I don't want to do this. Understandably, because the dude is a lunatic. Mm -hmm. um, and so Bucky goes in and the very first thing that Zemo starts doing is he starts running down the, the secret code words, essentially the, the trigger words that would be used to essentially activate the Winter Soldier in, in mind control, to Manchurian candidate him. And I thought that was great. And it showed that, you know, this no longer affecting, um, affecting Bucky in that way. And um, yeah, what did you think of the, the first kind of interaction between the two after, for the first time since Civil War? Well, um, <clears throat> I will say, yeah, him, him saying the words, I thought was cool because it was just sort of a taunt and he, you know, Bucky's like, it doesn't work anymore. And he's like, no, I just wanted to see how you'd react. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting that you brought up 90s thriller because this scene in particular but aspects of the entire episode were very silence of the lambs oh totally um in fact that first shot of baron zemo he's like sitting in the back of the cell completely in shadow mm -hmm. and then he leans forward into the light and that was i'm i'm certain that was a direct reference because that's exactly what hannibal lecter does mm -hmm. i think the first time clarice goes to talk to him mm -hmm. and it was like it was framed the same way and even like the basic premise of this episode is the good guys have to go see this psychopath in prison to get information and help. So I, yeah, I think, I think it was definitely inspired by Silence of the Lambs, which is a movie I absolutely love. Yeah, no, I, I got the same feeling as well. It, it's hard not to, especially when like, you know, they're talking, Bucky's talking to him behind a glass cage, essentially he's in prison. And, and I, part of the reason why Silence of the Lambs works so well is that that's, that's such a captivating uh, story or that's it's such a captivating uh, element with it within a story of having to to stoop so low that you're talking to this this murderer this criminal because you just need that bit of information and kind of biting and swallowing your pride and it'd be like we need to talk to this person it's captivating um yep. so yeah it definitely i i appreciated it because if if it rode the line well of um taking inspiration without being a full-on kind of ripoff right um and then we get a, after that, you know, there, there's a bit of a talk between Bucky, Bucky and, um, and uh, Zemo kind of like intimating that like, hey, there's more Winter Soldier like being made, you know, like we, you, we kind of shut down or you stopped the first program, but there's a whole other program. I bet you know where it is essentially, not in those words, but it's like, we need your help finding how the hell they're making more of these super soldiers. Um, and obviously uh, Zemo, has this this backstory this history of of his entire life being kind of taken from him to an extent because of not just the avengers but because of the super soldier program uh in general so he's he's interested but of course he's behind bars so what leads next to what leads next is a good old-fashioned jailbreak um mm -hmm. Done it, done in that kind of style. I, it reminded me of something but I can't place the exact reference but it was done in the style of Bucky and Sam are talking essentially Bucky's like we should break him out Sam's like don't do it and we're kind of flashing back and forth in between them having this conversation debating Bucky giving him a hypothetical and mm -hmm. seeing the plan unfold in action how did you feel about this it, it wasn't a big action scene but it was kind of a fun kind of um kind of almost heisty vibe to this to this moment I actually got um I got, and I don't know if this is what you were thinking of. I got an Ocean's Eleven vibe from it. Just in the way that sometimes in the movie, you'll see them 
they're discussing how they're going to do something and then it mm. cuts to them doing it then eventually it's revealed that that was like the practice run but still it yeah. kind of had that interesting and this that, that was one of my favorite sequences of this episode just the way mm. as soon as bucky started sort of laying out the plan right away before it cut away i was like oh you already did this didn't you i, yeah. I think you did mm -hmm. Yeah, I really liked that. And then Sam just getting like more and more frustrated as he's coming to realize that this this probably has already happened. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I, I enjoyed it and I'm glad it wasn't like just a big punch up, like we're gonna punch him out of jail. It was more clever than that, you know, wearing disguises and waiting for the opportune time and stuff. Of course, we it's it's revealed that you know this did actually happen. They Bucky did in some certain ways assist Zemo in coming out of prison. Sam's none too pleased about it, but it's like, hey, he's out of prison now let's just go mm -hmm. um what leads what happens next caught me off guard and maybe it's because i just haven't seen civil war in a while but it seemed like some either some retconning of baron zemo's backstory because once he's out of prison and they kind of get him away they're 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 jetting across the world essentially they're they're, they're going to the next location to find out more information about these super soldiers but if we find out that Baron Zemo is a Baron and he is loaded with, yes. with a private jet and everything, was that explained in, in Civil War that he was just this rich dude? Not that I recall, but again, it, for me, it's been quite a while as well. So I'm, yeah. I'm not certain. Yeah, so not necessarily holding it against it. It just seemed, because I've seen Civil War a few times. I just don't remember that. He seemed like just, my memory of it was that Zemo was just this dude um, who just happened to live in Sokovia. And you know, it, it seemed like he was a more of a, an average Joe, but in this, no, he's, he's Batman to an extent. He's, he's got millions of dollars in a Butler that was apparently waiting at the tarmac for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like, how was he, how did he know? I don't know. Well, and it's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because like, I just, I know he's called Baron Zemo. I'd never really thought about it. He was just a guy, you know, kind of a loose cannon trying to get the Avengers to go against each other, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but in this episode, I think they said, like, how do you have all this stuff? And he goes, well, I'm a Baron. And I was like, well, they do call you that. I guess I just never, never thought about it. I mean, yeah, sometimes I'm dumb. No, no, no. I, I think it's an, I'm, it could be another example of, um, in, in WandaVision when they called, um, Wanda the Scarlet Witch, I was like, did we, did we already call her that? Like right. in, in the, the series or the franchise, and now I'm trying to remember, like, did they call him Baron Zemo or was it just Zemo? I don't remember if they called him Baron. Either way, yeah, it was, I agree. I was right there with you. We're like, I just didn't really think that he was literally a Baron. I just right. thought it was like bad guy named Baron. I don't know, whatever. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, but so he's he's rich. Uh, they're loaded, uh, which is good. And he, he apparently has a, a ton of connections with, with CD Underworld stuff. Again, thought he was just an average Joe. So it's not just that he's rich, but he's also like been already a part of seemingly the criminal underworld. And um, he takes him across the world to this um, fictional city called Majapur, which I was a big fan of. I'm always a big, I always enjoy in, in kind of these types of movies where, uh, you know, comic book movies where they come up with a fictional city that you could see where it takes the influences mm -hmm. from, from different areas. Um, like Majapur looked like a mixture of Hong Kong and Singapore, um, but just super high tech, uh, Southeast Asian. I, I thought it was really cool. What did you think? Like um, from there, they kind of, you know, they go from where they, they land and essentially they're like, okay, we're going to go. I forget how they called it, but it was like uptown, but they're going down. Like they're going low, low, low to the, to the, the seediest parts of it. How did you feel about Majapur and, and as kind of like a, a city that, that in whole environment of them going there i thought it was really cool actually another <clears throat> another fictional city that it reminded me of was i think it was fang and ryan the last dragon like it had that kind uh, of sort uh, of on, on the water but very like kind of neon and mm -hmm. um yeah I, I i really liked that sequence uh just visually the city was was quite stunning i'm curious where they shot it um mm -hmm. i'm sure they you know cg'd a lot of it but yeah. Yeah. And it just seems like, you know, one of those cities where, you know, if you're a bad guy, you can go to that city and just get lost in the underbelly, you know? And yeah, um, like probably a city that's got like a lot of corruption and mm -hmm. all that. I, I love the the shot of them, uh, the three of them. And, and I did really like the interaction between Sam Bucky 
and Baron Zemo, like that sort of that truce, but there's not really trust, but it was also mm. weirdly on Zemo's end. It was weirdly kind of playful. Mm. Um, I, I liked that dynamic, but just that scene where they were walking across the bridge and there was, he was sort of telling them their, their characters that they were going to have to take on. And uh, I think Sam was smiling tiger or something and he was like, yeah. just like a pimp. And that was, that was really uh. funny. I liked that a lot. Totally. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. I like the, just the idea of it when they're on the plane and he was kind of giving him the, the DL on Magipore essentially was like, it was, it was like this city that just a bunch of deserted kind of pirates built. And it's just, so it's like this lawless kind of pirate town, yeah. um, which is, which is cool. And you, when they're walking down through the streets, you see kind of like, it's this awesome kind of amalgamation of different cultures and such. Like I said, it's very, very kind of, um, southeast asian but it's still very modern a lot of neon lights and everything and yeah this this is also really like the first time um outside of the plane where we get to see the interaction between the three of them zemo sam and, and bucky and it's great i think that daniel Bruhl um is is really kind of chewing the scenery here not, oh, yeah. not, going, not going overboard but he's so charismatic and i i really enjoy him in this role yeah, I, fr I first noticed him uh in inglorious bastards mm -hmm. but he's been a solid uh kind of supporting actor in a lot of things he wasn't given a ton to do in civil war so i'm glad that they brought him back and it's it's awesome like he like i said he i, I like the new added elements to him that he is kind of this more eccentric sort of um millionaire billionaire criminal it's yeah. cool I, and he's everyone's dressed to the nines like he's got a snazzy coat on um yeah uh sam is dressed I think they said he was like a, an African kind of drug lord or something. There was something, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, the <clears throat> in, in continuation with the other two episodes of having a little bit of social commentary in there, there was a quick line speaking because you mentioned it where Sam was like, I feel like a pimp because he's dressed in like this colorful, flashy, loud suit. And, and Baron Zemo essentially says something along the lines of like, that's pretty, that's really a very American train of thought that yeah. you see a well-dressed black man and you think he's a pimp right it was a subtle thing and they don't dwell, dwell on it but i'm like that's cool i mean that's yeah. that's smart it is sort of like why not take pride in in kind of you know like yeah sure you're dressed all fancy and, and such you're dressed flashy but your mind as an american automatically goes to pimp gangster yeah. bad it's like mm. um so yeah, it was it was it was yeah, a really like it was a really subtle line it kind of because we talked about you know the second episode when when it got to the racial divide. It was like a lot more obvious than it was in the first episode. Yes. The first episode was a lot more subtle about it. And this, again, this was just kind of like the one line. It was just there and then they mm -hmm. moved on, but it was yeah. there and it, it came across like loud and clear. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then, so from there they, they go across and they, they go into this underground kind of, uh, kind of club, kind of bar. Um, everyone's dancing for a bit. We get to see Zemo kind of get his groove on. Um, but the real reason why they're there is that I, I have to look up who the name of this person is, but I think it's Selby. 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 So essentially, again, their mission is to, to, um, try to gain information from these kind of criminal bosses, these kind of criminal underground Lords, um, of like, okay, there's more super soldiers being made. Who's making these super soldiers? Where can we find them? Just kind of following these breadcrumbs. Um, in order to do that, not only does Sam have to kind of pretend that he's this white tiger, he's in disguise, um, or smiling tiger, uh, but Bucky has to pretend essentially that he is still the Winter Soldier and is yeah. under mind control. And they have a, a pretty brutal hand-to-hand -hand fight in this bar. It's a classic bar brawl uh, where people are trying to like, are, are coming up on him and like you got to get out of here you can't be asking for for selby like she wants you dead uh and he's just like he says something like winter soldier get them or whatever the hell um yeah but I, I i love that like sebastian stan there was there was a moment there when you know even even baron zima says like you got to stay in character or whatever and there's a moment on sebastian Stan's face where you can see like the pain of him having to relive this, even though he's just playing a character in this moment, like mm -hmm. the fact that he's tried to get away from that persona for such a long time. And now he's got to go back into it to get the job done. I thought that yeah. was really good. Mm -hmm. No, completely. And it's, it, it was actually, it did a good job of, of it not just being like, we need an action scene for an action scene's sake, because uh, 
Bucky dispatches of them so efficiently and so deadly that Sam is even like, are you okay, man? Like he kind of puts his hand on on his arm, just kind of making sure like he's not losing it. He's not, right. he's not regressing. And that's one of the, the few times that we've seen Sam indicate out of his like kind of tough exterior that he does care about Bucky. Yeah. That he doesn't, and I don't think it was, I didn't take it as him asking like he's afraid of him, but more afraid for him. Yeah. Did you notice that as well? That he yeah. was, that he's shown that concern? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He, he he loves talking smack about how much he hates Bucky, but like that was, again, a little moment where it's maybe not that he loves him as a brother or anything, but he's got some kind of respect and 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 care for the guy. Yeah. Even if it's just not wanting, you know, a, a teammate to have to ex- to go back and experience that horrible trauma that they've experienced. Still, mm-hmm. there's 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 care there. Totally. Um, yeah, it's definitely not a brotherly relationship, but it could seek sort of like a distant cousin relationship, like someone where in the sense that it's one of those things where Sam is like, I can I can grill him all I want. I can make fun of him all I want, but only only I can do that. Like he has right. sort of this protection of him. And I think that's going to play in later. Like, I don't think that they're going to be, you know, hugging and, and high five and by the end of the show. But I think that there will, it is kind of leading into the fact that, you know what, we do have um initially a begrudging respect and then maybe not even a begrudging respect just sort of like i respect you i care about you we're still going to just you know constantly take digs but it's that kind of it's that kind of gruff kind of relationship which i like yeah um and going forward they meet i believe selby is the is the the power broker the titular power broker right I, I was not clear on that i don't know if the okay. I, again i don't know if it's the episode didn't make that clear or if i just missed mm. something but yeah, so uh, guys, we apologize because I'm right there with you. I've only seen this episode once, and maybe it'll be more more clear if I if I just did a kind of a rewatch because a lot of sh- stuff happened in this episode. Yeah. Um, but I believe that they were going to see the power broker, which is Selby, which um, is a woman from it was an actress. I forget her name, but she was from Lost. Um, and essentially, this is this scene didn't quite work for me because it seemed kind of it seemed kind of cutesy where essentially they, they, they're able to go talk with her. There's a bit of that kind of like tense dialogue of like, I could have just killed you and blah, blah, blah. And they're trying to get the information. And then Sam gets a call on his cell phone. It just starts ringing. Like, how long were you on that flight? How long did it take you to walk across the bridge down into the streets, into the bar, into there? You didn't, you didn't turn it off. You didn't put it in silent mode once. So that's one thing. Of course, Selby's like, answer it and in it's his sister sarah who blows the whole cover yeah. did that did that kind of come across as corny for you as well absolutely okay absolutely it, it felt not only corny but just like incredibly convenient to move the plot forward yeah you know like they just needed a way to get selby's ire up and get the shooting happening and it just it, it uh-huh. felt it felt very contrived to me yes like yeah. like sam sam's not an idiot you're not going to turn your, like you said, you're not going to turn your phone off by, before you go see this like crime boss. Really? Mm-hmm. I turn my phone off when I go to a movie. Yeah. I, I turn my phone off anyway. Like if I'm just going out, I don't need to hear it. It's on vibrate at the, I don't know, but it's like, yeah, if you're, you just fucking don't, <laughs> it's what, sorry. It's, sorry. it really did bother me. Cause I was just like, who doesn't turn the phone off? I don't, this is, in this time period, it's 2023 or something like that. So like that, yeah. people, people should know. Um, one real quick thing before I go forward. My favorite little moment was actually leading up to them um, kind of meeting with Selby because they're, they're being taken back there and they're walking in slow motion. They got these cool kind of neon shots. It's like this music video, kind of like rap music video, montage of them walking in slow motion. But it's got this like this French like classical French needle yes. drop song, like Edith Paif or something. Right. Uh, little things like that, I dig. It's little stylish touches like that that make it kind of pop a little more than just kind of the conventional, um, you know, OG Coca-Cola recipe Marvel movie. Um, obviously, you know, cool needle drops is, is nothing new to uh, to um, the Marvel movies, especially Gardens of Galaxy. But just little things like that where it's like, I mean, I know it's like I'm probably making a bigger moment out of it than it actually is. It was like 15 seconds, but it was like little examples of like that that are like, yeah, the show directed by Carrie Scoglin has a lot of 
interesting style. It feels yeah. it feels in in one part it's very similar to everything that's come in the MCU before, but also kind of going in newer directions. Yeah, it just it'll have these like little sort of flourishes of, of color and and flash and and uh -huh. that feel out of place, but in a good way to me. Like For sure. it, like it when it happens, like in that moment, I was kind of like, "That's an odd choice," and then I was like, "But I like it. It works." Yeah. No, I loved it. I thought it was, I kind of chuckled, but in a good way, because it was just like, it's so funny. And it's, I mean, it's so fun in the, it's a stylish kind of like, it's not necessary. They could have, you could have just walked from A to B, but it was also like, you could have had like insert any modern pop song and it just wouldn't have felt the same. But right. yeah, it's, it's not, yeah, not to belabor that point, but there's little flourishes, like you said, throughout all of the episodes that are, are similar. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, going back to the plot, cover gets blown by sam because he's a big old dum dum and uh then right when they're about to like selby's like oh my god kill him they're imposters then she gets wiped out she gets shot in the in the head um it's chaos that people like guns are going off the three the three musketeers they they you know break out like like rats from ratatouille when the chefs come in and stuff it's just like oh my god so they're running around in the streets there's a bit of an action scene and they find kind of their savior, someone that was kind of helping them kind of snipe people from, from afar was none other than Sharon Carter herself, uh, Emily Van Camp. It is Sharon, right? Yep. Okay, so Sharon Carter, who we haven't seen since Civil War, where she kissed Steve Rogers, uh, who is now her uncle. Yep. Um, that's the, the first and only thought that I had when she came on the screen. Did you think that too? That, that flashed in my head for sure. Uh, now, I have a question for you, because she yeah. mentions a little bit later in the episode, she mentions uh, that uh, if she goes back to America, she'll be arrested immediately. And I'm trying to remember, is that something they set up in Civil War that I don't remember? Or was that something they were suggesting just happened in between and they didn't? Like, do you have any idea? Yes and no. Um, it's it, it's weird because a, a lot of people at the end of Civil War, essentially anybody that kind of was on Steve's side um, essentially got kind of court-martialed or, or, or they were criminals. And she was right. one of them where um, they were Congratulations, breaking- Congratulations, Cap, you're, you're a criminal Exactly. Now, right? um, they were breaking against the Sokovia Accords and she was one of them that helped. Obviously she wasn't uh, you know, in the airport fighting people. Uh, she was <laughs> doing, doing her own things. Um, but they didn't quite show her get like arrested, but it was, I think it was, under the assumption that yes, she uh, was a criminal. However, okay. however, d there seems to be like forgiveness for for Sam who also broke the law, for Bucky who broke the shit out of the law. Mm -hmm. I get that they're Avengers and she's not, but I thought it was kind of weird that she didn't get any sort of pardon, that she's just like on the run still. Right. Uh, years later, with, is that kind of weird, right? It's a little weird. I, I like like you said maybe maybe the Avengers because they're Avengers get a bit more of a pass but mm. it kind of feels like you know it's all or nothing here right yeah either you're a criminal or you're not mm -hmm. for sure um so I, I it's it's a minor thing it's it's more of like a nitpick for me but sure she's still a criminal um jump kind of going a little like speeding it up a bit so we're not kind of hitting every scene um i like her reintroduction i think that in addition to how zemo's character i think was kind of given a little extra oomph i think that sharon's character was given a little more to do she was not the mo nothing against emily Va emily van camp the actress um but she wasn't given too much to do in um winter soldier or um civil war right. but here She's kind of a cool character. She's got a bit of an edge to her. Obviously, she can. She we we see later on that she could definitely handle herself um, in a fight. Like she was kicking ass oh, yeah. towards the end. Um, but she's also got a bit of an edge. Like she's got a bit of a snark to her. She's she's classy. She's living in this like upper upper kind of high class um, penthouse in Majapur, where she like seemingly makes money by selling stolen arts, like stolen classics, like Monet's and Van Gogh's and, and stuff um and so she's in the, so i really like that i like that change in her character where it's like all right cool i um we she, she's there for the rest of the episode and um just to kind of jump around a bit she eventually like the they kind of part ways like her her mission on this episode was done so she's like oh i gotta go back and do blah 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 blah. i'm not gonna be in the next episode probably 
and that kind of bummed me because I actually really liked her addition to it. I thought that her, along with Zemo, added some nice kind of banter and and an interesting sort of a character character play off of all of them. Did you enjoy her coming back, or were you just kind of like, eh, she's fine? No, I did. I actually um, one one moment that I really liked, and it was such a such a little moment, but when she's explaining that she sells these works of art. And Sam's like, no, these are all in museums. And then she and Bucky are saying like, no, usually in museums, they're fake. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, oh yeah, you guys are more worldly than Sam. And Bucky's just like, what's Google tell you? And he's just like, well, shit. <laughs> like that was, it was just a little yeah. like kind of playful, uh, you know, banter sort of push, push, push back, whatever. Yeah. Uh, I really liked that. But yeah, she had like, I, I don't like her character in the other two films, like never really stood out to me all that much. Like you said, she didn't have all that much to do, but here, like she had a lot of charisma and, and I, I, like whenever she was on screen, my eye was drawn towards her because like just the way she was talking and all of that, I thought it was really, really good. And yeah, I hope, I hope you're wrong about her not being any more of the episodes, but I, I, yeah. I think you're probably right. I, I hope, I, I hope I'm wrong too. Cause I really enjoyed it. And like I said, I was, it was setting off like, all right, the three musketeers again are going to go off like Zemo, Sam, and, and Bucky. But I was like, Br bring her along. She's awesome. Like, not only is she a cool character now in and of herself, but I liked her dynamic with the team. Yeah. Um, so they meet up with her. Um, this is also where it gets a bit 90s convoluted for me, where it's a lot of talk about, we got to go to meet this person. He's over there and he's doing this. And, and it's a lot of talk about people we don't know about, people that we haven't been introduced to, and they're all off screen. Right. And so without getting into without like remembering the specifics she's like we got to go find this dr nagel or nagel um Something like that yeah and so they go to the shipyard and there's a bunch of like you know crates and um it's the same scene from batman begins when batman <laughs> is is uh appears for the first time um and they essentially find like a hidden kind of in in between one of the crates they find a, a little passageway to which was which was the same scene from the Dark Knight, where how he gets into the uh, the bat uh, the bat cave. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. um, and they find a little secret laboratory, and um, they find Doctor Nagel there. And it's essentially it's what follows is sort of like a mixture of an action scene with them kind of interrogating this guy. So they're inter interrogating this guy, where it's like, "Where's the sir? you made the super soldiers? How many did you make? What? How'd you do it? Blah blah blah." And he's kind of telling them. Uh, seems oddly unfazed by having, you know, the winter soldier <laughs> kind of point a gun at his face. Uh, but while that's happening, um, Sharon is kind of fighting off people and really to hold in her, holding her own. Any thoughts on kind of that, that sequence? Uh, well, that fight was awesome. Again, you know, I'm really liking what Carrie Scoglin is doing with the show. She's really using a little bit too much shaky cam for my taste. And every shot of that fight was just super shaking. It was driving me a little bit mm -hmm. crazy, but yeah. the choreography was great. You really felt the blows mm -hmm. and like uh, Emily Van Camp, like she crushed it. Like that, that choreography, like she nailed it. And I thought it was great. Um, and it was, it was an interesting juxtaposition cutting between that and then this conversation in the lab, which, you know, there were uh, moments of raised voices, but a lot of it was this guy who had a very, he was very kind of soft-spoken and uh, it was, it was, cool to cut back and forth between the two. And you mentioned that this show, like WandaVision touched on it, but this show is definitely dealing with the blip a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And he even talks about, you know, they were like, why did you stop your work? And he was like, well, I, I turned to dust. And then five years later I came back and they'd closed down the program. Yeah. I really liked that. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think I agree with you. The shaky cam, part of the reason why the shaky cam is sort of an, is, is so noticeable is that, like, you know, in the Bourne movies, a lot of them, like in Bourne Ultimatum and stuff, sometimes it was sh so shaky that you couldn't tell what was going on. Yeah. But this, everything's still framed in a way that you can see the action clearly, but that only brings out the artifice of the shaky cam because it feels like we're shaking it, but not too much. We got to make sure everything's still in frame, which is, you know, it tend ideally that's what you want to do, but it just makes it seem like you're not, I don't know, it just seems forced whenever they do the shaky cam. But I agree. I thought the fights were were pretty brutal. Uh, the choreography is really good. I even said to my wife, I'm like, this is violent because it wasn't just like shooting people. She was stabbing people and throwing knives and faces. And, you know, it's PG-13. There's no blood or anything. But it was like, oh, wow, she's 
knifing guys. Um, I, I did kind of get a feeling as I was watching, I was like, this almost feels like it's treading new ground for the MCU. Like it, it felt more brutal, even though you didn't see anything specifically, uh-huh. it felt a lot more brutal than a lot of what I'm used to. And maybe it's just cause it's not people shooting freaking laser beams, but mm-hmm. it, yeah, it was, it was down. It was dirty. To, to kind of quote a, a, what's it called? The dark knight. I, I think it's something to do with the knife. It's just something, the fact that she was using a knife to stab people and, and guns are too quick and knives right. are personal. Um, so it feels more like, Ugh. um, so yeah, great, really cool action scene. Interesting kind of interrogation scene that's kind of being intercut. Um, essentially the dude's kind of clamming up. He's not giving them really what they, what they're saying. And he's kind of showboating and kind of gloating like, Oh, these super, those old super soldiers suck, but these new super soldiers are, they're not, they're not all super uh, buff. You know what I mean? Like they don't look like Steve Rogers. They can be anybody, which shows why a lot of the people from the flag smasher smashers are, they look like, you know, GQ models. They, <laughs> they look super skinny and fit or like, but they don't look like super soldiers. Right. Um, so it was cool. And Until Baron, they're punching you in the face. Yeah. So Baron Zemo, like they, they start getting inundated with, with more people coming in more than even Emily. I keep calling them the actress more than Sharon can, <laughs> more than Emily, the actress herself can even handle. <laughs> um, so uh, Baron gets sick of it. Shoots the uh, shoots Doctor Nagel by it was a it was a nice cameo. Um, obviously, that kind of blows their plan op- like open. You know what I mean? It, it kind of like it's one of those things where it's like they had this plan. Things were going in an order, and then just all hell breaks loose. Like the the villains are coming, the bad guys are coming with guns. Uh, Zemo shot their lead, and once again, Ratatouille. They're just trying to scurrying around and kind of some fun banter of kind of like we got to go this way, no, we got to go this way. Um, and we see Baron Zemo be kind of a badass in this moment too. Yeah. Again, in Civil War, he just seemed like the more of like this nebbish kind of just average guy who used only his intellect to to kind of overcome his his enemies. In this, he's not he's not like a superhero or anything, but he knows how to handle a gun. He's you know blowing stuff up. He he jumped off and kind of like you know stabbed somebody and. Um, Again, were you were you out for him in that kind of character shift of him being like, oh, he's also a deadly killer with his you, hands? You know, it, it's kind of going back to what we were saying about the little flourishes earlier. I was like, uh-huh. that seems very jarring that now he's this guy, mm-hmm. but it's cool. I'm digging it. Uh, yeah. he's, he's got the he's got the Bane jacket on. And he's got his, his oh. purple mask. And yeah, that shot of him jumping from like one crate to the other. I was like, that was cool. I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd hurt my knee if I did that. So <laughs> this guy's rich and kind of super powered. I don't know. Yeah. He he's got a he's got a cool mask on. Got a little little hockey like a little purple hockey mask. Kind of go thrown back to his his look in the comics. You're right. That jacket is snazzy, man. I mean mm-hmm. that that coat. Um. So yeah, they they save the day. They get they they. Uh, or at least they save themselves. And this is kind of where they part ways. So the three of them, Bucky, Sam, and uh, Zemo, are, are buggering off on a car. Uh, Sharon's like, I can't. I got to do. She's pulling a Rose Tico from like the last, from right. the Rise of Skywalker. Yeah. They're like, come along with us. Like, oh, I, I'm so busy. I just, I wish I could. And then she's, <laughs> then she's gone. Um, and that's when we kind of check back in with the Flag Smashers uh, a bit. And this is kind of what I was getting into about how this was the first time that we've really seen him go full on domestic terrorists because before, you know, they like robbed a bank. They, they kind of got in, in, in some fisticuffs with, with uh, Sam and Bucky and, and Captain America. But in this they she, the, the main bad, bad guy, bad girl, whatever. I don't know what her actual name is in the show. Um, uh, it's Carly, I think. Yes. Yeah. So we get a little bit of background of her, how, um, you know, she has like a sick mother and um, she's implicated. She, she was visiting her mother in one of those GRC kind of like um, camps. I don't know. It's kind of, it was someplace in, La- in Latvia where they were, where it was kind of like this detention center, but not, but not for like necessarily prisoners, but it was like, they were like immigrants almost. There was like these migrants that it's like, we don't know where to, where to put you. So here's like your own little block, little ghetto. Right. Um, and so we get a little background for her so we can kind of understand her her fury or and kind of her her anger at the world 
but she goes hardcore like she there's this whole building full of people still like trapped inside that she kind of either beat up or hogtied and then she just lets it you know burst into flames yeah and, and lets the people die burning alive and even the dude one of her other flag smashers next to her was like holy shit like it's it seemed like he, she was crossing the line even for him which makes me which is sorry i was just gonna say which leads me to believe that this is the first time that they are kind of going into that that direction of like full-on terrorists yeah um, yeah, yeah I, I, I liked that little moment where the guy turns to her and says, like, there were people alive in there. Like, mm. like he realizes that, like, she's ruthless. And she has, throughout this whole show, up until that point, she's always seemed, you know, a bit of an extremist, but she didn't seem like an overly violent, mm -hmm. like, she's, in her mind, she's trying to help, and then she just murders all of these innocent people. And he says, like, there were people alive and she said like this is the only language that people understand she yeah said, all right you just went like full-on ruthless terrorist yeah with with yeah. you know one shot and a couple of lines and yeah it's so any sort of kind of sympathy even though like they they gave a bit of explanation or a bit a bit of backstory so it's not just like she's vil she's evil for the sake of being evil but at this point, it's like any sort of sympathy I had for her is kind of it's kind of gone. I think yeah. when you're bur burning innocent people alive, there's no redemption arc for that, in my opinion. Um, I think the term for someone who does that is a jerk. <laughs> we got to have to bleep that out. It's true. It's, it's just a big old beep. Um, sorry, guys. Sorry, I just I got really sorry, upset. To... <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we get there. And the last kind of two scenes, essentially, one show uh johnny walker that's his name right johnny walker strolling through um the prison where zemo escaped and he's he's got a scooby-doo nose on somehow he's just like <laughs> it's it's bucky and them um even though there's no like real evidence and even his 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 buddy his guy i forget what his name is um is just like hey man this is you can't just be accusing falcon and this other guy of like you know doing this even though they actually did but essentially the guy was like hey man we can't we can't just be like accusing people and taking down people without any proof without any evidence and johnny walker is says something along the lines of like taking matters into his own hands yeah. and and that's the biggest kind of like the hypocrisy of it because he's coming in especially into this scene like they broke the law they're doing this like, how dare they break the law to, to meet their ends? Like, uh, but I'm going to be able to do that. So yeah. essentially now saying- let's like, go I'm, break the law. Yeah, exactly. So I'm like, uh, it's making me like the character less. Um, but not, once again, not in a bad way, not in a way of where I think it's a bad character, like a right. poorly written character. But it's sort of like, again, the sympathy that I'm having for this guy is sort of like, well, if you're being a hypocritical douche like that, then whatever. Mm-hmm similar feelings kind of in that regard totally totally that was that was my first thought i was just like it it reminded me of the scene um in that movie crash which i know it won an oscar i don't understand how i hated that movie it, but didn't it, it came out i'm sorry i was just gonna say didn't it come out the same year as brokeback mountain and it won over Brokeback may, mountain I okay yeah have, it's yeah. one of the weirdest oscar wins of all time but yeah continue there's that there's that moment where Sandra Bullock and uh, Brendan Fraser are like walking towards their car and Ludacris is standing on the street with his buddy and he's like, look at these fucking racist people. They think we're going to go rob them just because we're black. <clears throat> well, let's go rob them. And it's like, I got that distinct thing from John Walker in this scene. It's the same, yeah. that same hypocrisy, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but like you said, it's 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 making me dislike the character in a way that's making me like the character, if that makes any sense. Like I'm appreciating yes. that they're kind of manipulating how I feel about this character and kind of constantly making me question how I feel about him and all that. I'm, I'm digging that aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think a, a character that you actually dislike in a meaning, meaning like you, it's a villainous character, kind of a character, an antagonist to an extent that you, you actively root against is a well-written character. So yeah. there's, there's, so, you know, when we're saying it's like, oh, I don't like him. It's well, again, I just want to reiterate. It's not us saying poorly written character, poorly acted. No, there's depth to him. And I, and I appreciate that. So I'm liking, not liking him. Right. Um, and, and going forward, the last kind of scene of the, of this episode is the, the three musketeers. They're in 
Latvia, which which was introduced earlier on. Again, that's uh, that's where we saw um, the Flag Smasher leader. Um, who you just said her name, Carly. Carly. She she's bugging around there. It seems like her mother or her or her family members uh, are sick in in kind of in one of those detention centers. So there's obviously going to be some overlapping. They're going to they're trying to find where these Flag Smashers are. And while they're walking up to like kind of seemingly their, their next location, Bucky's like, hold on, I gotta, I gotta go, you know, I'm gonna go take a walk. And they're like, you okay? It's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. So we kind of see him walking. We see him kind of pick up this small like orb, this, this metallic orb. It looks kind of like a tracker. And we don't really know what it is or who it is, like, or who's setting these. And he walks a bit more, he finds a couple more. He's kind of looking around and just like Batman, um, someone appears and he's like, I was expecting, I don't know if he said I was expecting specifically you or essentially someone like you to come. And essentially it is uh, the character, I have to look it up again. It's the character uh, Ayo, A-Y-O, played by uh, Florence Kasumba, who is from both, she was introduced in in Civil War, uh, and but she was also in Black Panther. She was one of the uh, the guards. She was one of the right. Black Panthers guards. The what is the? I forget what the name of of yeah, that. What is it? Mm. Uh, it's essentially the badass women with the shaved heads. The absolute, you know, total badasses. Um, but Dora, I was Dora Milaje, something like that. I think you're right. I I want to say that sounds right. If, if but so guys, I apologize if that's from Black Panther. But it's like that's a different tribe. So I apologize. It's been a bit since I've seen Black Panther. But I recognized her right away, and I was like, ah, oh, it was cool. Yeah. And and that's something. That's that's what I like. And in in I like again. I, I thought a bit about like the WandaVision, how there was so much hype built up on every cameo, every this, this, and that. But this sort of reminded me more of like how Don Cheadle was just in one episode. Yeah. Where it felt more organic. It wasn't hyping up like, oh shit, you're not going to believe who's here. But it's a recognizable character that is hopefully going to get like similar to, to Sharon and similar to Zemo is going to get fleshed out more in this show than she has before. Yeah. Um, I mean, because of course the connection is that Bucky was hanging around after Civil War. He was hanging around in Wakanda for several years and he, get, he got a moniker of the White Wolf and he's kind of yeah. living kind of a quieter, peaceful life. Um, do you have any thoughts? Were you excited when you saw kind of Ayo return? I, I was, I, I was kind of like, I was like, okay, I recognize your face. Uh, I remember you from Black Panther. I don't remember specifically anything about your character. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think she had that big of a role in that movie, but it's like, you know, <clears throat> obviously you're probably not going to bring in like Shuri for this show, but to have a member of the Dora Milaje, if that is in fact what they're called, that that makes sense. That makes sense to me. And I thought I thought that was a cool reveal. And like you said, it wasn't it wasn't built up. It was just I mean, you could tell the way he was walking and turning around that someone was going to show up. Yeah. Um, just the way that you could tell after the Selby fight, like obviously they had some kind of guardian angel. You knew it was going to be somebody, but, but it wasn't like this crazy buildup. It was just like, and here's this person. Yeah. So, so cool. Yeah, totally. Um, two things. One, you're absolutely right. It is the Dora Milaje. Um, so that's, yeah, she's what she's a part of them. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. Um, it was more the implication as opposed to like, hell yeah, it's Ayo, because I didn't even know her, her character's name without looking it up. But I recognized her and I, it, it got me excited for two reasons. One is because like, yeah, man, like Bucky had spent a, seemingly a lot of time in Wakanda and I want to see, he probably made these connections. So I want to, I love Black Panther and I love the mythology of, of Wakanda, uh, the lore. And so if they're bringing more elements of like Wakanda and, and Wakandans into the show, I'm all for it. Yeah. Um, but also, yeah to, yeah, to your point, like she, she didn't, this actress didn't have that many lines in Civil War, didn't really have many lines in, in Black Panther. Um, so it's not like that character so far has been fleshed out, but I'm hoping that they do what they did, like I said, for Sharon and Zemo, where it's like, oh, this is a full-on character now. It's not just some side side character that's kind of in a couple scenes. It's like she's she's an integral part of the story. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I think that's a... And, and again, I'm glad that there hasn't been any sort of false alarm so far. There's been no red herrings. There's not been like, you won't believe who's going to be showing up next episode of, of kind of this overhyped train i don't know if if um 
if Mar if Marvel sent some some memos after WandaVision to some of the actors when they're like, when you're talking about the show, shut the up about this. Um, but yeah, so it did set up for me an interesting kind of um I would say it's not a cliffhanger, but this this is the first episode where I I have been like, okay, where is this going? Where I, I am the ending has specifically intrigued me as to what the what is the very next scene that's going to happen? What's the interaction between Bucky and Ayo? Um, did you are you feeling that as well, or is it similar to the other episodes where you're like, oh, that was cool. I'll tune in next week. I mean, I'm I'm curious to see where it goes. I'm mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not I'm not dying for it. You know, yeah. uh, this mm -hmm. this show just hasn't hasn't got me there yet. I feel like maybe the final two episodes are going to be really crazy, and then it's going to end, and I'm going to be like, damn, I want more. Yeah. But right now, I'm just not at that place. I feel. I, sh like. I should say we should probably move on. Yeah. Um, but you know, good episode. Not not one of my favorites of the show so far, but I, I dug it. Uh, and yeah, I believe that was the halfway mark. So we got three more, and then we're done. Yeah, man. Uh, but this is a good way to lead into our next topic. So Marvel Studios put out a brand new trailer for. Black Widow. I believe they put it out yesterday. Black Widow has had quite a story behind it. It was supposed to come out uh, May 1st of 2020. Got pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. They kept saying, okay, now it's coming to the theaters. Pandemic. No, now it's coming to the theaters. Pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now it's coming out, I believe it's July 9th in theaters and on Disney Plus with premium access, so it's probably going to cost you like 30 bucks. Um, I watched this trailer uh, shortly before we did the podcast really like this trailer uh, like i'm i've been looking forward to this movie because i really like scarlett johansson in the role i love the cast of this film um this trailer like really got me hyped uh what do you what, what sort of overall thoughts for you yeah um i i was already on board for this you know i was i was gearing up i was ready ready to go uh when it was coming about just last year before the pandemic um i I actually was planning on not watching this trailer before you asked me to, just because I we had seen like we were we were this close to it coming out. I think that uh, sometime last year, like the final official theatrical trailer had been released, meaning like all that's coming out next are going to be TV spots that are just kind of like a a, a mashup of the trailers we've seen. So I felt like I'd already seen a lot of this movie, and I kind of wanted to keep it. Um, keep as many surprises that have that are still yet to be revealed kind of keep that but so after watching the trailer i was surprised or pleasantly surprised and i feel like the marketing team kind of felt that as well because uh, the good beginning chunk of this is a lot of stock footage that we've seen from previous marvel movies kind of setting up the character in the, in the story of black widow so although this is the two minute trailer it like like a third of it is is footage that we've already seen yeah from previous movies which is good because like i said i think they've shown a lot in trailers and such prior to this so you don't need to reveal that much i'm already on board but of course they needed to put something else out because it has been pushed back and back and back that you they need to remind people that hey this is still coming out this is still a thing please check it out uh i'm surprised though that they're i don't i think i feel like this is going to also lead into our next conversation because I feel like Disney might be, I don't think they're going to go back on it, but I, I, I would be surprised if some execs are not rethinking the decision to simultaneously release it on Premiere on Disney Plus as in theaters. Because as we're going to talk about, it's seeming like theaters are kind of coming back. And, yeah. and I'm glad that they're, they're releasing this, but honestly, at this point in July... You probably could have just released it in theaters and still might have made made a profit. What do you think? I'll say this too, uh, as as to your point about not wanting to reveal too much in the trailers and whatever. Why now? For if this is in fact like the last trailer they're going to put out, it's still like still a good like two months. Like yeah, after after all this time of waiting, why not why not wait until like mid June instead of like the beginning of April? Yeah, no, so that's like that's a very fresh, good point. Fresh in everybody's mind, and then you don't have to worry about because again, if this trailer goes out of the sort of the conversation by by June, and then they go, oh, we got to put something else out because nobody's talking about this, and you got to show even more stuff. 
Mm -hmm. I feel like they jumped the gun a little bit. I mean, I'm not a marketing expert, but uh, I feel like that was a little early. Um, sorry, I went off on a tangent. What was your question? No, no, no. I, I want to actually touch on that, but I, I, cause I agree. I think that typically uh, the final trailer um, is released within two months of, of a movie's being released. Obviously yeah, usually, it's, not, yeah. it's not set in stone, but it's usually within two months because that gives you enough time one to get the word out. Um, it, it's close enough to it that people aren't going to forget about it. And then, um, they, then they can start revving up with the, the TV, the TV spot ads, you know, where it's like 30 seconds, 15 seconds, yada, yada. Um, releasing the trailer, you know, a little over three months, uh, closer to four months or like three and a half months before it comes out. It's like, are, is there going to be another trailer that's coming out? Like, I don't know. I agree. It seemed like they were, they were kind of the marketing was kind of going out a little too early for a movie that's been postponed, you know, <laughs> over a year. Yeah. Um, I'm a little worried though, that it's that people have lost some interest. Um, I think that this movie was coming out at the perfect time when, when initially in, in May of 2020, it was the first Marvel movie since Spider-Man far from home. It was kind of going into the backstory of, of Black Widow, who, you know, people were still reeling from her spoilers, her death in Endgame. Um, spoilers for the second biggest movie of all time. Um, and I feel like people were really excited for it. But now with, with WandaVision, uh, you know, come and gone and kind of opening up new doors for Marvel, Falcon and Winter Soldier already kind of scratching that, that sort of, black, that kind of, uh, Black Widow itch in the sense of like it's also an espionage kind of uh, Winter Soldier type uh, action film and we have Loki series coming out we have Shang-Chi we have the Eternals which is like you know that's sounding like it's going to be amazing and totally different it, 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 do you think I'm wrong in that it it seems like Black Widow kind of missed the right at right the mark that it should have came out to be like the most successful. It seems almost kind of like an afterthought now that it's like, well, this is it's not going to advance the story. It's not really breaking new ground. It's just kind of. Yeah, no, I, I think so, too. I mean, I, I think even if it, they release it in theaters and on Premiere Plus, like it's, it's going to make money. I don't know how much the movie costs, so I don't know how profitable it would be, because, of course, mm even if you're charging 30 bucks on premiere uh, Disney plus premiere, you know, it's getting pirated like immediately. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. that's going to be a thing. Uh, and not to mention, I mean, you know, 30 bucks is, I, I don't know what a movie ticket costs where you are for me here. It's usually between like 12 and 16 bucks. So 30 bucks is, you know, twice that, but you know, I could, you know, families could watch the movie, like a family of five could watch the movie for 30 bucks, which is, yeah way less than they would take at the box office though granted disney plus premiere they get to keep all of that money like theaters don't get a take so there there is that to factor in but um i yeah i do kind of i feel like it not that it missed its window i i don't think it's going to be a failure i think people are really going to like it mm -hmm. but i don't think the hype is there for it the way it was and i think it missed its window of being as successful as it could have been yes yeah, I think that's a better way of putting it. Yeah, so I don't, yeah, I don't think it's going to be a bomb or anything, but I think that I was really expecting, like I was getting in kind of like internet arguments with people, let's say in December of 2019, early, early 2019, before the pandemic really hit. I was convinced, I was like, I think Black Widow is going to be a billion dollar film. I, I really do. I, it just felt like there was so much goodwill coming out after uh, Endgame and people really did want to see a Black Widow movie. And obviously because it's a pan it's still a pandemic it's not going to make that but I, I also just feel like i don't think people are as excited to see it but it, i still think it's going to make money um the, the only other question i have is that since this is coming out in july um do you think that you're going to check this out in theaters or do you think you're going to get it on disney plus i'm not sure what your plans are i mean it depends on it depends on this, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. if I've been vaccinated by then, yeah, I'll go see the theater. I'm dying to go back to, to seeing things in the theater. Yeah. I love it. But the way it's working in Canada right now, I think the chances of me being okay. vaccinated by then are not good. So uh, okay. I'll, yeah. I'll stay home. 
What about you? I got gotcha. you. I wasn't I wasn't sure what was going on with with um with Canada's vaccination. Yeah, we're, well, we're, uh, we're you guys are doing a lot better than we are. Which is it's 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 an ebb and flow because you guys were doing so much better just handling the pandemic than America was. America is just like just oh, it was awful for for a year. But um, yeah, at least where where I live, I can I think soon I will be eligible to get a vaccine because right now it's just kind of like essential workers and yeah, um, elderly folk. Um elderly folk i don't know i've never said that um but yeah i agree it's one of that's what that was kind of why i brought up the question room like um and to segue into our next topic is that if i was if i'm vaccinated like get both shots of it and and it's you know soon and then this movie's coming out in july i want to see it in theaters man especially yeah. because yeah movie movie tickets around here are about 15 bucks my wife and i are gonna you know we're gonna go together so it, it's gonna be about 30 dollars in general they want to pay 30 dollars to to see it on a giant screen or do i want to pay 30 dollars to stay in my home again i want to go i'm gonna go out to the theater um right. and yeah and to to cleverly slide into the next topic um unless you have anything else to say about the trailer uh just a couple quick things I, I, oh yeah uh, go for it oh yeah I really like the music in the trailer. I like the mm. way they sort of took the Black uh, Black Widow theme and fused it with the Avengers theme because, mm. you know, that first chunk of the trailer was looking back anyway. I really like that. Some really good looking action. Um, one of the things I'm most excited for in this movie is Florence Pugh. I've become a huge Florence Pugh fan. She's amazing. The first thing I saw her, and I saw it at TIFF a couple of years back, uh, the Chris Pine movie, Outlaw King. She was great in that. She was in this little horror movie. Um, I think it was called Malevolent. And it, like, it wasn't great, but she was really good. Fighting with my family. She crushed it in that. Mm -hmm. I didn't love Midsommar, but she was really good. So I'm like, I'm all on the Florence Pugh train. And I found mm -hmm. out she's not in the trailer, but I was looking at the cast list. And we see in the trailer, we see like young... Uh, um, Scarjo? Scarjo, yeah. Uh, well, I, young, whatever her character's name is, I'm blanking on it. But that's Natasha, Natasha, Natasha Romanoff. I was, I just kept wanting to say Wanda Maximoff. <laughs> um, we see her as a kid, so and I was looking at the cast list, so I guess we're going to see her sister as a kid too. And I found it, the girl who's playing her sister as a kid, uh, her name's Violet McGraw, and we've talked about this show before. Um, she played young Nell on Haunting of Hill House, and I thought she was great on that show. Oh. So I'm looking forward Dude, to that. But apparently Marvel is is a big is a big fan of that show and they're just like grabbing those kids. They're like right? cuz cuz WandaVision had one of the kids. You said you told me from Hill House. So yeah. interesting. Yeah. Interesting. The other twin, yeah. Yeah. So so that was cool. Um yeah, I like the music. Uh that's about it. I, yeah, I really, I, I'm I'm really looking forward to this thing. Yeah, no, I'm I'm still excited for it. I I want to see it. Um I think that if there is going to be another trailer, I want to steer clear from it because I do. I want to. I want to go in kind of fresh, even though I don't think they revealed too much. It's. I. I still want to see it. Um, one last thing I'll say is that, as, as terrific as the Marvel shows have been looking, I did like aesthetically, in the in the production in the budget, I still. It's hard to place it into words, but I could still tell that this is a movie. And Falcon and the Winter Soldier is a television show. It's it's the the lines are super blurred, and I think most like the average fan or the average movie goer would be like, I can't tell the difference. But there's just something. There's a little bit more of a of a stylized a stylization to to the cinematography, like a little more of a of a higher quality. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you do you agree or no? I can, I can kind of see that, particularly just in in this trailer. And by no means is Falcon Winter Soldier small in scope, but this movie looks huge in scope. Yeah. Like some of those shots are just like, there's so much going on. It's so expansive. Yeah. And mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's not a knock on the, on the shows. It's just, this one did, it did feel like, yeah, it feels kind of just, it has that movie look again, which is also getting me excited because I'm enjoying the Marvel shows, but I'm like, yeah, if, you, if there is still going to be like that slight kind of edge to the movies, then hell yeah. I'm, I'm consider me a fan gonna i'm gonna go back to the theater and, and and check these movies out as soon as it's safe to do so um but yeah so a quality quality trailer i'm still looking forward to this thing don't push it back again i swear to god i just want to see this movie finally yeah so uh we got a couple uh, more topics we're gonna sort of just kind of rip through them because we're running low on time but mm -hmm. so you wanted to talk about and i did see this earlier that uh god's uh, godzilla versus kong because it did come out theatrically. Now, granted, it didn't make 
a huge amount of money theatrically, but for the pandemic, mm-hmm. uh, what, what was it like sort of $10 million opening weekend or something? Uh, no, it was that's like what 10, I saw. It was $10 million opening day. Okay. So for the five day global, uh, for the five day holiday weekend, uh, cause it's today's Easter apparently, um, happy Easter to everyone that, that celebrates it. Indeed. Um, yeah, this is going to come out the day after Easter. So it's <laughs> happy day after Easter, but it made $48.5 million domestically in five days, which that's pretty you know, good. That's really good. I mean, can I put this into, into comparison? The, uh, the last Godzilla movie made about $40 million in three days. And that was before the pandemic. So right. this is uh, by far the biggest pandemic uh, opening weekend for a movie. Um, since since the pandemic started essentially um and so the the la the the second the closest one the second biggest one was 16 million over three days for wonder woman 1984 okay. um so this one this this opens up a few different interesting things um for me well i find i find this this news fascinating uh sorry well i'm also like looking up the global box office because it's doing quite well globally um but essentially what i find so fascinating is that I think I think movie theaters are coming back. I think that with the start of the at the start of um, the pandemic, and especially when a lot of movies were being postponed and pushed back, and and Warner Brothers was doing the thing of um, like you know releasing things on HBO Max simultaneously, everyone was was ringing the death bells like, oh, movie theaters are done. Movie theaters are done. And I've always been of the opinion that no, they're not. Um, I, the way that I was I would describe it to people is that think of it like this i would ask like normal people, just average joes you know who would go to the movies i would or just go out and do stuff i would say if i could tell you that for the next year through 2022 um essentially you will have all of the food all of the best food you want delivered just to your door okay it'll be delivered just to your door you would pay the regular rate yada yada but it'll be delivered directly to you now after a year would you never want to go to a restaurant again right it's a good analogy. The answer to me is is no. And I've probably said this on the show before, so I'm sorry if I'm beating a dead horse. But essentially, it, it, going to the movies is an experience. It's it's a th- it's something to do. It's a shared experience in the same way that going to a concert is a shared experience. The same way that going to a restaurant is an experience. You don't go just for the food to a restaurant. You don't go just to simply audibly hear music to, at a concert. And you don't go just to watch a movie. Uh, it's an you you want to see a movie on the biggest screen possible. You want to ex- share the experience with people. I know that you know there's social distancing and and it, a lot of people are kind of being far more afraid to be in crowds than we we have been in the past. But I think there's this this longing to have that communal experience again of, of seeing a movie, especially opening weekend, a big dumb blockbuster like Godzilla versus Kong, where you're just shoving your face your face full of popcorn. You're cheering along. You're laughing along. You're clapping. You're booing. Whatever. Um, that's not something that you can capture just by releasing stuff on on TV. Do you, yeah. do you agree kind of with that sentiment? Yeah, it's it's absolutely a communal experience. I, <clears throat> I mentioned on one of the shows one time, um, might have been one of our practice runs, I don't know, but uh, when I saw Endgame in the theater, mm-hmm. uh, you know, everyone comes back through the portals and blah, 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 and they're all lining up. And you hear Cap go, Avengers! And this woman in the crowd shouted, say it. And the whole place just <laughs> lost it. Everyone was just laughing. And then he said it and they charged and everyone was cheering. And like, I will never forget that memory. That was amazing. Yeah. Oh, totally. So, I mean, yeah, 2019 was, it, it sucks because right after, you know, didn't go to the movies barely at all. But 2019 had a lot of good moments of, of, of theater going moments that really reaffirmed why I love going to the theaters. Uh, so every time I've seen Avengers in, Endgame in theaters, that ending, you know, whole of it throughout. I mean, especially because I saw opening night, it was going crazy. And that really elevated my experience, just the, just sharing with just strangers. And that's what, it sounds strange if you're going to try to communicate what movie going is like to someone that's never heard of it before. You're like, so you're sitting in a dark room with hundreds of people, you don't know, just staring at a screen and you're like, yeah, it's awesome. Um, But you're sharing with these, with these strangers, this like, immense joy and laughter and tears and it's great um i remember the the ending the last 10 minutes of once upon a time in hollywood um got 
was the theater was losing their minds as well. It seemed like it was a big Tarantino, you know, group because it was opening night. Right. But still, it was it was just one of those things as well where it's like it's so much fun sharing in with an audience just like losing their minds. Um, but you know what is also what's also interesting to me about this news is that the movie was released simultaneously on HBO Max. People can watch this at home, not even for a premium subscription. You could you yeah. know, do a seven day free trial. You can just do you know, however much it costs for a monthly thing. And yet people are still choosing to go see movies on theaters, in, in theaters. So not only is this nearly $50 million um, uh, five day weekend good just for a pandemic release, but I also think it's good for a movie that you can get instantly at home. Like yeah. you said, in in people are pirating. You can pirate it probably. I'm not endorsing that. In fact, I really don't endorse that. I say p- artists deserve to be paid. Um, but don't, don't isn't that kind of interesting as well? That it's like, hey, you can watch this movie at home, and people are still kind of flocking to the theaters. To you can watch. You can watch this movie at home for you know, the, I forget what HBO max costs every month, but like, yeah, you're, you're already paying that anyway. You're not paying anything extra. You don't have to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and to your point about people who say that movie theater is going to be done. I, I think this proves otherwise now, granted is this price tag going to save the movie theater industry in and of itself? No, of course not, but it's certainly indicative that people do genuinely want to get back to the theater. Mm. Yeah, two two quick things before before we move on. Just a little interesting things to note. Um, in addition to that to that um, to that domestic opening, so far Godzilla vs Kong has garnered worldwide two hundred eighty five million dollars. So oh. that's in that it's it's been open for like like a week. So it's doing quite well, and this can actually be potentially a, a, a bona fide hit. It could potentially be not just like we they broke they kind of broke even. It could I mean maybe I wouldn't say that I maybe I'll walk that back because I think the movie did cost maybe over two hundred million. But this is the closest thing to a um, to a massive Hollywood success that we've had since twenty nineteen. So I think that it, I think it's going to end closer to kind of four hundred million, which is better than you know Tenet did. It's better than any other movies done in in uh, close to you know, 16, 18 months. But one last thing I want to, I do want to say, which, which kind of helps bolster my opinion that I think that international box office is going to be back to normal, if not in 2022, then 2023. Um, Because there is another movie called Detective Chinatown 3. I don't know if you've heard of this. So uh, there's a, it's a, it's a Chinese, it's a Chinese series called Detective, Detective Chinatown, kind of like an action comedy series, very popular in China. Um, it has grossed just in China alone, or just in Eastern Asian markets, it has grossed six hundred eighty-six million dollars. Jeez! And this it released in twenty twenty-one, and I I only bring that up not to be like, wow, big number, but it's like, yeah. In in obviously China has has a much larger population than in than North America has, um, but it I think to me it also just shows like, man, if a movie is making close to seven hundred million dollars, movie theaters are not dead. And it, right. it's also, I think, a bit, uh, it's a bit egotistical to be like, oh, well, North American movie theaters are, are struggling. So movie theaters are dead. And it's like, well, there are other countries that, mm-hmm. that still have movie theaters opening. China's making $700 million with one movie. Movie theaters are not dead. It's, it, that was one little, little thing before we, we finish this, um, that I, I don't like the hubris and kind of the the nationalism that's i'm sounding pretentious but it really is just kind of like oh well amc theaters in in america is closing down nobody wants to go to the movies and there's like there's a billion effing people in china that are going to the movies what are you talking about yeah no it's true i would agree uh Uh, so yeah let's we're we're not going to spend a lot of time on on godzilla versus kong because again uh i've got my spoiler free review on my channel we've got chris and andres's very spoilery uh, review on my channel, um, but we just want to talk about it just a little bit. Um, and I, I mentioned in my review that uh, you and Andres are huge Godzilla guys. Mm. I'm not. I mean, I have nothing against Godzilla, but I don't. I've seen all the movies in this franchise. I don't think I've seen anything else. I haven't seen the Matthew Broderick one. I haven't seen the, the really old ones. I'm not, you know, giant monsters punching each other. That's cool. I, I like King mm. Kong because I, I like gorillas, but um, I thought this movie was 
absolutely absurd and i really had a lot of fun with it what were your what were your sort of overall yeah um yeah i separated it for certain there's very few franchises where i have to separate um be of two minds one is the the movie fan the kind of movie critic to an extent and then just kind of the fanboy and i'm I'm a diehard godzilla fanboy so in that regard i thought it was terrific it really kind of delivered a lot of what i wanted to see ever since i was a kid um in a in an american hollywood produced godzilla film i wanted to see the fights uh that was one of my big complaints with the 2019 godzilla king of the monsters was that uh the weird aesthetic choice to have everything in the darkness and shrouded in smoke and fog and debris and rain it was visually unappealing and i i what should have been like the mm moment at the end of that movie godzilla fighting king Ghidorah, which is one of his classic nemeses i was really just in the theater just like this over like i was really i couldn't tell what was going on and and that's not what you want um but yeah this delivered it godzilla fought king kong they fought multiple times uh they there's other um there's other monsters going in are we doing spoilers i don't know yeah yeah oh so spoilers so mecha godzilla's in this and which is also one of my favorite you know classic monsters uh from the japanese series and just so it just delivered i thought that adam wingard's direction was very um visually kinetic and he has he the way he kind of choreographed the fights and a lot of the different kind of um, unique camera angles that he's had were kind of mounting the camera on like sides of planes and seeing you know seeing the monsters out of out of a cockpit that's flying away there's a lot of really cool dynamic shots it was all the fights either took place in the day or it was in the center of hong kong which is lit up with with these neon buildings created kind of a beautiful landscape for them to kind of destroy um, so it, it delivered. I Godzilla fought King Kong. I could see it. It was well done. And I enjoyed it. Um, it was also goofy as hell. Like it goes to, you know, essentially H.G. Wells's journey to the center of the earth for, for a bit. That, yeah. Okay. So that, that sequence, I was just like, and I, I understand that like they've referenced the hollow earth in the other movies, uh-huh. but like that whole thing, I was just like, what am I watching? They're following them in a spaceship and then he finds Stormbreaker. And yeah. so he's got his battle axe now, which is made of like Godzilla like, fins or something. I don't know. And then it gets charged up later on. It's just like, this is so ridiculous. Mm-hmm. But like, I'm smiling. I'm having a good time. And I will say, you were talking about how kinetically this movie was shot. There was one shot. I had to rewind it and watch it again. Cause it, I was just like, oh my God, that was amazing. And so it was in the big battle in Hong Kong. And I guess, I don't know, to try and set up the shot. I guess we're, we're, we're following the spaceship and then Kong's over here and then mm-hmm. there's a building and then Godzilla's behind the building. And so they fly past Kong's shoulder. I, th- I think they've just been thrown out of the, the vortex, whatever. So they don't, they don't have control of the spaceship. Uh-huh. It's not a spaceship, but whatever. Uh, so they fly by Kong's shoulder and they're going straight towards the building, which they're going to smash into and die. But in that moment, Godzilla on the other side of the building is breathing his fire through the building, which makes a hole that they go through and then they cruise past his face. And I was like, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. No, I, I, that shot definitely stood out to me as well. Cause it's, it's almost like an, it's almost like a one shot. There's a couple of reaction shots, but it's done in a way that it's sort of POV of the character sitting in this cockpit, flying by these giant monsters in battle. So you see like a giant you know, King Kong, half of his face kind of fly by. And then you're kind of upside down while Godzilla is like breathing his fire. And the sound design on that was also incredible. Like they did yeah. a really cool thing of how like you hear Kong's roar and then it's just like the rumble of the fire. And then just for a brief moment, as you pass by Godzilla, you hear his roar. Like it's like fleeting. Like you're like, meow. And it's yeah. <laughs> just like that. Um, but yeah, a lot of cool shots just like that. And um, yeah, I, I, I like the journey to the center of the earth stuff. Oddly enough, that's, pr- I never thought I would say this in an American Godzilla movie, but that's probably the weirdest or the most fan- fantasy that this series has ever gone. Even including the the Japanese, I won't say it's the silliest, but it's like, they've, they've never had like a journey to the center of the earth, kind of like there's a sunlight in the middle of the earth where right. it doesn't make any sense. That That's where the kind of the critic brain comes in where I, I wasn't hammering this film or I don't think, I don't think it's terrible. Um, but it's dumb. It's none of it makes sense. It's yeah. the you know the science of it doesn't add up. The the plot's convoluted. The characters range from uh, just kind of dull and boring to 
to genuinely genuinely unlikable like i was really not digging the i like brian tyree henry um as an actor yeah me too he was kind of bugging me in this uh and especially the dynamic between him and julian dennison just did not work for me and i wanted that whole subplot to just just be cut it didn't um, need to be there at all like it did okay. not add anything it was just it was just i think it was there a to bring back millie bobby brown because she's 11 and people like her and b it feels like they just wanted to have that you know 2012 the movie not the year the, like the trope of the crackpot person who's got the pirate radio station who's telling the truth but they're actually right and they're actually onto something but they're crazy and you know and i guess they had him in there for comic relief and i did get some laughs out of him and i do like the guy but cut that whole subplot yeah. kyle yeah. chandler was like basically a background character in this movie the the villain uh i believe his name was maxwell lord um <laughs> he was just like you know, they're setting him up to be this like benevolent character but from his first moment on the screen. You're like, okay, so that that's the villain. Like that was really obvious. Um, but I got to see King Kong and Godzilla punching each other. And I thought the fighting was great. I mean, they, they definitely learned their lesson from 2014's Godzilla where everyone complained that you never saw him. You see a lot of both of them. The fighting is great. I thought the visual effects in this movie were really, really strong. Mm -hmm. uh, Kong in particular, I mean, you know, like I would imagine that lizard scales are probably a lot easier to render than fur. Uh -huh. He looked great. I also yeah. did, I did find it ridiculous that somehow this like nine-year-old girl taught a gorilla sign language a little the, much. I mean, the nobody, I, then nobody noticed. Yeah, because right. like, <laughs> do I mean, if he was if he was like the size of King Kong in in other King Kong movies, where he's like maybe twenty five feet tall, sure. But the ch she's an ant to him, right. and she's like signing with her fingers. How the hell is he gonna see that? Anyway, and her her little child fingers, no less. You know, that's exactly yeah. So yeah. it makes no sense. Um, I I agree with you with the, I would have cut the entire subplot with Millie Bobby Brown, the whole Team Godzilla, and give keep the same runtime but use those moments to flesh out the Kong team because I, well, I found them kind of dull. I liked, they were, they weren't unlikable. And I feel like if you gave them more time, we could have kind of liked them. You know, Alexander Skarsgård's character seemingly had sort of like a connection, like a previous history with Rebecca Hall, but that's yeah. never touched on. Yeah. Um, I did, even though it makes no sense that the little girl could sign to Kong, I liked that relationship there's actually kind of a surprisingly quiet touching moment where she walks out onto the ship where kong is chained up at night and it's raining and he's distressed and it the sound kind of cuts out just boom and you don't hear much and they kind of they kind of touch obviously kong would smash her because she's yep. an ant but i like that moment i like that it was done entirely visually there was no dumb force dialogue and uh, so i like that I, I don't know about you. Like, like I said, I, in the in the way that they are now, they're not interesting characters. That kind of trio, but if you cut the Godzilla team, if you cut that subplot, and gave more backstory, just or a little more something for the Kong team, they might have been okay characters. They might have been decent characters, but they didn't. So what we ended up with is half boring characters, half annoying characters, dumb villains that you don't care about. Although. I was kind of liking Damien Bashir in it. Like he he played it, he played it completely like a mustache twirling villain. Yes. And I just I just liked his voice and he's drinking a whiskey or whatever. So it's corny and it's stupid, but I was like, I like that. I like I like him. Too bad he's he's given nothing in it, whatever. But yeah. I did I did on. appreciate like the way he went out was straight up Sam Jackson and Deep Blue Sea. Like it was the exact you know, he's there, he's monologuing, and then you see like the thing just come from behind and just rip him out and yeah. I dug that. That was fun. One thing, and, and we'll, we'll wrap this up here in a second, but one thing that did drive me crazy, about, or not even drive me crazy, I found it such a bizarre choice uh -huh. was the soundtrack. Not the score, but the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. It was so bizarre to me. Now, you know, I just watched Skull Island a couple of days ago because I hadn't seen it and I wanted to do my due diligence, what have you. There are lots of songs in Skull Island, but those are in scenes dealing with people, be it the military or what have you. And that uh -huh. feels perfectly natural. But like this movie opens with Kong 
wandering around his island and there's a pop song playing and it was such a bizarre choice mm-hmm. and then they do that they do that throughout the movie and then the the credits start with uh i don't remember what song but i don't know did you did you find that like distracting or did it work for you how'd you feel about that um it kind of it kind of worked in in the first scene just because it was it was sort of off-putting like it, not in a bad way but it, it i like the juxtaposition where it's like hey it's it's because we we went it went from like like I said I really didn't like Godzilla King of the Monsters from 2019 so the fact that this started right off the bat with being a bit quirky I was already like I'm liking this more instead of the this is so deadly serious all of uh, the jargon the science I was like all right that's kind of goofy but it did keep happening and there was another part when he was on the it was on the ship and there was something there was a song playing and it, it happened enough where I'm like yeah these are kind of weird needle drops that that aren't really necessary they this, the songs didn't lend nearly enough to the experience the way that the songs in Kong Skull Island did. Right. Um, Kong Skull Island, although there was a, there's some, some cliched kind of Vietnam era needle drops in that, it was still era appropriate and it kind of set the mood yeah. and it felt, it felt consistent. Here, it just kind of felt a little over the place. It felt like Adam Wingard um, was just kind of like, I like this song, put it in. I like this song, put it in. Right. Um, one, one thing I'll say is good for Adam Wingard. I'm glad he's got another win. This is seemingly fans are seeming to enjoy this. It's getting a generally positive reception. He's kind of been on a, on a downward trajectory. Um, for anybody that doesn't know Adam Wingard, he did some two fantastic films that I recommend. One is your next and the other is the guest. I haven't um, seen either of them. I've been meaning to go back and check them out. Yeah, I, honestly, I think you'd really check it out. I mean, I we would re- check out your next first. It's it's really a great subversive kind of um, home invasion film. I think okay. you would really appreciate it. So I, it was one of those people where I was watching his his career, and then he made Blair Witch. Ugh, that was no, I did not like it. And then he made Death Note for Netflix. And it's like, uh, oh god. So he's. I'm glad to see this this once indie darling kind of get a franchise film right. That's a little side note. Yeah, that's cool. Good for you, Adam Wingard. Well done, sir. Uh, so yeah, that is the show for today, everybody. Um, we uh, we want to thank you for watching. We want to encourage you to, you know, do the YouTube thing, like, subscribe, ring the bell. Definitely comment down below with your thoughts on Godzilla versus Kong or what you, are you looking forward to Black Widow or what'd you think of Falcon Winter Soldier? Uh, I do read all the comments. I try and respond to everything. So uh don't don't think your words go uh uh unbidden i don't think that's the right word uh we will be back next week uh andres will be with us no idea what we're going to be talking about aside from falcon winter soldier but we'll figure it out Mm -hmm. uh so yeah we want to before we go uh chris where can people follow you online uh you can follow me on instagram uh my handle is art of light and shadow uh it's a fun kind of just kind of daily blog of me talking about the movies that I watched throughout the year. We kind of explore some lesser known obscure films, some arty films and whatever I was feeling for the day. So it's a lot of fun. If you want to check out Andres's stuff, he does reviews on his YouTube channel. Uh, do a YouTube search for, uh, oh, now I'm going to blank on it. Cheap Thrills, Unspeakable Terror. Uh, his, his videos are really short. They're a lot of fun. So definitely check them out. You can follow me obviously here on my YouTube channel or on Twitter and Instagram at Courtshake. I will leave links to all of that in the description below, but we'll see you guys next week. We want to say once again, thank you for watching. We hope you guys are all safe and healthy in this time and we'll see you next week. Later guys. Bye.